Oh man, you know, we, we, we knew this was going to happen. We just didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And uh, I, I still am just so glad, man, to keep hearing what's happening at Healing Springs and uh, through, through the leadership that God has given Jeffrey and uh, uh, the, great, the great reports that are coming out. And, and uh, I just pray that uh, this church would just be a lighthouse and a beacon in this community to, uh, to reach people all around this area. Y'all keep telling people about the good news and uh, what God is doing here. People, people will keep responding. So I'm here for a couple reasons tonight. And I don't mind you even sharing. I don't mind laying my cards on the table and saying this is what we're here for. Uh, number one, we're here to talk about why in the world we would take our family to New York. And uh, I've already heard it tonight. I usually hear it. You usually see it in a lot of people's eyes. Uh, you know, people just look like, what in the world are you thinking? And, uh, and I've been asking God that same question. God, what are you thinking? Uh, I'm Southern. I'm small town Southern. I'm not just a South Carolina guy. I'm a, I'm a small town South Carolina guy. I mean, Kershaw has about as many people as black. I don't know what the town limits of black, black, the whole. Kershaw has 1,800. And uh, we're going to a county of a million and a half people. And uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know what all God is doing, but we know that He's called us to go, and uh, we wouldn't be doing that if we if we didn't think He was. And uh, so I'm here to talk about that. Why we would do that? I'll share a couple of different reasons why, and uh, that I think are pretty compelling. And uh, I think I think when we when we hear it, we either have we either have one one or two things we can do. We can say, God, I don't care what you're doing, or we can say, Man, God, you're going to do some awesome things. And, and so I'm going to share why we're doing what we're doing. And then I'm also going to do this. I'm going to challenge you to actually think about some things, to so pray about some things, and contemplate some things. And I'm always glad when there are, are younger people here because, because they're still a little more flexible than older people are and uh, because they still have a little bit more life to live. Some of their decisions aren't made and set and stole the way some of us older folks uh, get. And, uh, and so I'm always glad to be able to appeal to younger people and say, listen, there is something greater to live for than money. There is something greater to live for than sex. There is something greater to live for than happiness and your own security. And that is, that is living after and following after hard the will of God. And, uh, and, and I love just being able to share because, because this has been a six-month journey for Tasha and I. Uh, we told our church uh, back in the 1st of August that we were going to be leaving in the 1st of March and, uh, and moving to New York to become missionary church planners. And, uh, and, and, and God has taken us all over the place since then. We were, uh, we were going into Brooklyn. We were actually going to be moving into Brooklyn, getting a, getting a three-bedroom apartment. That's what we thought we were going to be doing. And all God was waiting on was for us to say, God will go. We'll move to that area. And then God started shifting and moving things on us. And, and so we've gone from living in the heart of Brooklyn, New York, which is one of the five boroughs of New York City, to now being just on the outskirts uh, out of Long Island, which, in there, which we have found out there's actually more need for a gospel uh, ministry there than, than even, even in Brooklyn. And I, I say that to say, y'all, listen, whenever you're following God's will, and I want everybody to hear me tonight, when you are in the center of God's will and you're doing what God has called you to do, no matter what, I'm going to tell you that is always a good thing. Uh, God's will doesn't come to us written on an email sometimes where He says, hey, on such and such a day, at such and such a time, this is exactly what's going to happen. God's will didn't come to us that way. God just calls us most of the time, generally, just says, follow me. And uh, I love the idea of Henry Blackaby uh, and experiencing God when Blackaby says, listen, the, what we ought to do is find out where God's moving, get involved there, wherever He's moving, just, and just serve Him there. And, uh, and so usually that's what happens when God compels us or calls us to go. Uh, and, and I'm glad for that, aren't you? I'm glad to know that when God called me a pastor to preach, uh, somebody was even talking about it earlier, said, hey, when you got right out of high school and came to Healing Springs, I'm glad to know when God called us and we were willing to follow Him that He didn't tell us everything that was going to happen. Uh, quite honestly, then, I don't know that I would have said, yeah, Lord, Brooklyn sounds good uh, when you're 36 <laughs> years old. Uh, I, I, quite honestly, I, I, I know for sure God would have told me this, you're going to have to go through this business meeting. Your family's going to be trashed in front of the whole church. Uh, lies are going to be told about you. I got a feeling that on that night, if God would have told me that, I would have said thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I'll just be a high school football coach, and I'll have a little bit more control of my own destiny, God. And uh, as if we have any control at all of our lives. Um, God has all control of our lives. And so I'm, I'm glad to know that God didn't tell us everything. But when you follow God's will, it's always a good thing. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, uh, the Bible uh, says this. It says, I've got it on the screen, I know you can see that. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. God has good things in store. He has good things in mind for all of us. Now, that doesn't always turn out the way that we think it is, but it's always God's will that's going to happen in our lives. And no matter what, that's always the best thing for us. Even when Paul had his head chopped off 
on the missions field because he was serving Jesus. That was the best thing for Paul at that particular time. Because God got the glory from that when Peter was hung upside down on the cross and died for a Savior. That was the best thing for Peter at that time because it was God's will for him to gain the glory out of Peter's life in that, in that particular detail. I'm here to tell you, listen, it always works out for our good when God's will is being done in and through our lives. And sometimes that doesn't mean when, when Joel Osteen preaches on this passage, right? He refers and he's talking about getting a Mercedes or getting a BMW or getting a big mansion to live in. That's not what Jeremiah 29 11 is all about. Jeremiah 29 11 says, listen, your life is always going to happen according to the will of God. And as we pray, as we see God's will, that is always the best thing for us. Amen? Amen. 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 He was springs and we believe that with, with, with all with all of our heart. By the way, when Jeremiah 29 11 was spoken, when God told Jeremiah to tell the people of Israel these words, they were in exile in Babylon. And I hear a lot of people, a lot of people look and they see New York City. And by the way, most people who come up and tell us about New York and how dangerous it is, you know what they've done? They've never been outside of South Carolina. Most of those people know New York because they watched Law and Order on television. <laughs> and I'm like, turn off your television. Turn off your television. New York is actually the safest big city in the world. It's the safest big city in the world. It's the safest big city in America. A lot of people say, well, you need to watch around every corner. Listen, go to Columbia, South Carolina. Have y'all watched WRS News? Columbia, South Carolina is turning into one of the most dangerous places on the planet. Charlotte, North Carolina is an hour north of us in Kershaw, one of the most dangerous cities in, in our country. Atlanta, Georgia, just right here in our good old southeastern part of the United States of America, one of the most dangerous cities in our country. That's what we found out. I don't know what, what the deal is, but all these cities in the southeast that are major cities, Birmingham, Alabama, all in the Bible Belt are some of the most dangerous cities in the, in the world. And, uh, and so, listen, you can be killed, you can be, you can, uh, somebody, somebody told me this about New York, they said, they said, now when you're walking down the road, if somebody's across the road walking the elbow on the sidewalk, you better not raise your hand and wave at them, because they might do something to you. I said, if I'm walking down the road in South Carolina, I'm not waving my hand at somebody across the road, they probably might do something to me too. Like, Who, who's going, ah, I'm going to say, what in the world is that nut doing? <laughs> And so, so we, we say all those things and say, I just want you to know, if you're here tonight, I, you, you need to be, I, if you hear one thing from us, I don't want you to hear, oh man, good for James and Tasha. I want you to hear this, I want you to hear, and I want you to pray this for yourself. God, what do you want me to do? God, what is it that you want me to do? Have you ever asked God that question? I mean, have you ever really sat down and said, God, where do you want me to live? God, what car do you want me to drive? Lord, where do you want my house to be? I, I'm convinced that most people in the southeast, you know why we live where we live? Because we live on family plan, that family owned, or a lot of us did or do, or we live somewhere close to that. We live where we live because that's where our parents, our grandparents grew up. And we never have really asked God, God, where do you want me to live my life? There's no way anybody can tell me in the world that we have all these Christians in the southeast part of the United States that we call the Bible Belt. I don't believe it's the Bible Belt because most of the people don't believe in the Bible. I call it the church Belt. There's no way you can tell me that most of these people who live in the southeast, we've got more Christians in these states, Mississippi, South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, are some of the most Christian or church, uh, churchy states, uh, the most rigid, religiously uh, affiliated states in the country. There's no way in the world you can ever convince me that God just called all these believers just to stay where they are when the rest of our country is dying and going to hell, when the rest of our world is dying and going to hell, there's no way you can tell me I have seriously and I have seriously contemplated and meditated, God, where do you want me to live my life? And he told me to stay in the southeast. There's absolutely no way. Because our lives are supposed to be lived with a different purpose in mind. And we live in the purpose of God. And God's purpose is to save the world. I want you to know that tonight. And, and, and sometimes we'll say, well, God, I want you to bless me. But we really, what we don't begin, we say, God, I want to follow you. I want you to bless me in that. But usually what we say is, God, this is what I'm going to do. And I want you to bless what I'm about to do. Instead of saying, God, I just want to do what you want me to do. And I'm going to be blessed in that. And, and by the way, that's not the Christian wall. That's not the Christian life. The Christian walk is we follow God and we go where He leads us. Even though we may not know what in the world that looks like, we don't know what all the details are going to look like, we follow God because He has sent us. We learned a lot about faith over the last six months. We thought we knew about faith, and uh, we, we have learned an awful lot about faith over these last six months. By the way, Tasha and I, when I, when I leave Friday morning, 
Um, we're going to leave. Hopefully, we're not like this in between 5 and 5.30. And we hope to get to uh, we hope to get to Long Island, our house in Sherwood, New York. We hope to get there by about 8.30 that night. It's going to take about 15 hours is what we're thinking to drive, uh, drive there. That will be the first time I see our house. Um, we still haven't seen our house. We haven't even seen a picture of our house, by the way. Um, we, we God has actually orchestrated it for us to live in a parsonage. And the last pastor who came in trashed the place. And so some of our friends have been painting it for us. Um, they went in and painted it. He said, he said, it's okay. It's actually livable. It's just a little dirty right now. So we're just going to paint the walls. He said, I will send you pictures as soon as we get done. They're not done yet. So y'all pray to get it done by Friday um, at, at 8.30. That way some of the stuff will, 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 will be, be dry. So that does lead me to show you why in the world, in case you don't know who our family is, this is our family. And, uh, and I put this picture because if you do know our family, you know this is our family. And uh, this is what things are like around the Rogers house. And uh, so mom's usually a little more under control in this picture, so, uh, um, but, but dad, dad, is, dad is certainly this way. What leads a family? What leads a family like ours with four children um, who, are, who are all young? What leads our family to, to leave our families, to leave our friends? By the way, I, uh, we, we had a, we, this, these past couple weeks have just been really difficult weeks, been really hard weeks. We've had to say goodbye to our church family last week. Um, we said goodbye to some of my family members last uh, last uh, Saturday. Uh, just last night, my hunting partner, um, Tasha uh, calls him my boyfriend, um, <laughs> my hunting partner, my fishing partner, and I've been, I've been spending time with uh, on a regular basis for the last six years. Man, he and I, he's a big old guy, a big old guy. We were both hugging and crying and crying on each other's shoulder. Like, oh, fish, fish. <laughs> and uh, we were trying to laugh it off. And what causes us to leave? What causes us to leave our home, our family, our friends? and go to a place where we have never lived, none of our family has ever lived there, what would cause us to do so? Well, I just want to walk through, first of all, some biblical reasons why. I want you to know, listen, Scripture compels us to go. When we read the Bible, and by the way, I think you're going to be hard-pressed if you actually read the Bible and follow it and believe it. You can read it and just uh, say, yeah, it's just a book. But if you believe the Bible is God's Word the way you ought to, there's no way you can read the Bible and not become a missionary. And not come away with the idea that God expects you to be a missionary in your life. And there's no difference in, in that between us and you. There's absolutely no difference. Sometimes we, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were at the missions conference, Jeff, with y'all's association. And, and uh, we were introduced as the missionaries. Well, here are the missionaries. And I remember we used to, you, we used to, we used to, used to kind of bring the missionaries up. And it was almost like a catwalk, you know, there. So there's missionaries in there. And uh, y'all see them, you know, it's almost like, you know, they're, they're the model, those kind of things. Y'all, the only difference between us and y'all is that we're moving to New York to do what you're supposed to be doing here. That's the only difference. Uh, we're, trust me, I can go back to the picture. I promise you, we are nothing special. Um, this morning, we were we left our house at 7 o'clock this morning and headed to Lexington, South Carolina. And, uh, and it was chaos in our car, man. I mean, chaos. We just bought a brand new car so that our family could all ride together in New York and and, uh, and so, uh, so, so we were on the way, and we got this new DVD player, and it ain't working right. I mean, we put, it's working right. We just can't figure out how to do it. I, I mean, our kids, are, they're playing paper, rock, scissors. And you know what happens when you get an 8-year-old, a 6-year-old playing paper, rock, scissors. The rock starts just beating everything, right? Don't just beat the scissors. It beats your sister as well. And, uh, and so we've we got paper, rock, scissors. Well, we've got kids crying. we got, we got me and Tasha. I'm just over here laughing, just thinking, this is chaos, and Tasha's trying to keep it all together, all of her hair in her head, and all those kind of things. And, and, and then we got to the church, we were sort of joking with you about, we were laughing about this. She said, all right, now it's time to start acting holy. We're in church now. We're in church now. We're just like you are. There's nothing special. Any of y'all know what I'm talking about? Right? You fight, you bust all the way. All right, all right, put a smile on your face. So excited. Preacher, we got it all in control. No, that's what we were doing. That's what we do most of the time. Except we just we just stopped faking it now. You know, we just started. Uh, I look at some people at the church, uh, and they just know it's been a bad morning. Right? So that's why I leave early, Jeff. I don't know if you do or not. I just leave our house early on Sunday morning just to say, oh, peace. Give me some, give me some peace. What what causes us to go? Well, scripture compels us. Scripture. When we read the Bible, we have to pray God where He wants to go. Where He wants to go. You say, well, where do you get that from? Well, God loves the whole world, right? John chapter 3, verse 16. The verse that we know, I know, I know this sounds wrong. This is the best verse you can come up with. We've known this all of our lives. Sometimes we're so familiar with verses, we forget what the verses say. Y'all ever do that? 
You know, sometimes we just get so familiar with them, we forget they say. John chapter 3, verse 16, you, you can see it, right? God loves the whole world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. By the way, let me, let me remind the Son of this, okay? This is hard for us sometimes. It's very hard for us sometimes. God loves the whole world. <laughs> he doesn't just love our little small southerness and our little areas. Southerners are so prideful in loving our cities and our towns and our area. We are. And I can say that if I wasn't Southern, if I was a Yankee coming down here and saying it, then it wouldn't be right. I can say it because I know I've lived here all my life. And trust me, I fight those feelings myself. Right? The Gamecocks are the best thing in the world. I don't know if they're winning right now, but no matter what, if Clemson beats them or not, we're still better, right? So, I mean, we're, we're just so territorial and so prideful of those things. And we, we think, we think that, that God only loves us. And you say, well, how do you know that? Why do you say that? Well, because, because we, we, we refer to people who are from not from here. We give them derogatory names. Like Yankees. I, I mean, we, we say that so derogatory. We, we've got friends of ours who are, who are Asian who live in Kershaw. They're the only Asian couple that live in Kershaw. Um, they run a Chinese restaurant, and I hear it so often because they're not from South Carolina. They're not white. They're not middle class. And what do we hear? We hear this from all of our friends. Oh, you're going to go eat that rat and that cat, huh? And what I want to do is I want to punch somebody because they're talking about my friends. See, those people are real people. They're not just the people who run the Chinese restaurant. They are real people. They're not from here. They're from China. But as I read John chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says God has loved the world. He loved the world so much, what? That He sent His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in Him, that African American, that Asian, that Indian who runs these gas stations around here, who manages the, the motels and the hotels, that whoever believes in Him, that Yankee who has that, who has that thick, nasally accent that we just can't stand the Southerners, that person, no matter who they are, if they believe in Him, they would not perish, but they would have eternal life. God loves the whole world. And we need to be reminded that we need to see the world the way God does because we so often don't. We need to have a, a heart shift and say, God, help me to see people the way that you do. God loves the world, the whole world. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 10, here's what Paul says. Paul says, uh, let me get to my, my verse out here. Paul says this, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching or someone going and sharing? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Here, there we go. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Listen, it's one thing that, that we know that God loves the world, but it's another thing for the world to know that. And I know, I know what we think. I know what we think. We think, well, doesn't the world know that? Healing Springs, Jens Branch, let us not be so naive to think that our world knows the story of the gospel. And uh, the week after Thanksgiving this past year, we were actually at a church presenting. We weren't even going to Long Island. We were just going to Brooklyn. And right in the middle of the message, Jeffrey, right in the middle of the sermon, man, I'm preaching on a Sunday morning to this church, sharing our story. And this woman just speaks out. I mean, she just answers. She starts talking to me from, from, the, from the crowd. And, uh, and, and, I mean, she, and this is what she said. She said, this guy knows what he's talking about. Y'all need to listen to him. And I wanted to say, I'm the preacher. You be quiet. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm trying to figure out, who is this woman? Does she not know what we do in Baptist churches? We don't talk back to the preacher. We say, hey, amen. That's it. That's it. You don't ask. You don't say things. She said, this guy, and so I just started having a conversation with her. Turns out she's from Long Island. Lived there the first 35 years of her life. And here's what she said. She said, this guy knows what he's talking about. She said, I lived on Long Island for 35 years, and the whole 35 years I was there, I didn't know one Christian. Like one Christian. You know, did you know that 82% of Buddhists that live in America don't know one Christian? Do you know that 67% of Hindus who live in America don't know one Christian? Now, you know what the sad thing is? They do. I've got friends who are Hindus who run gas stations outside of Kershaw. 
And I know that they know Christians, but you know what they know them as? They know them as those white guys who go in there and get the beer and buy the porn. That's what they know them as. Do they really know a Christian? I, I, would, I would question whether they really do or not. Yeah, we, we have got to know the world needs to hear the gospel. And Paul says in Romans chapter 10, if we don't go, how can they know? If we don't share, how can they hear? And how can we go if God doesn't send us? And he has sent us. Are we, are we, are we listening to him? I don't even know this. Listen, not only does God love the world, but God desires the world to know him. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, I'll share this with you. Here's what the Bible says about Jesus. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages. Make sure I got it all there. Jesus went throughout all the village, all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. In other words, he was out there where the dirty people are. Those people that we talk about in our churches. Those people that won't ever come in our church. They're just out there in our world because they don't think they're welcome in our churches. And we know the truth, right? We know that if they were to come, that they would be welcome. But, but nobody's ever gone and told them. Nobody's ever actually loved them and said, man, I want you to know. I want you to be a part of what we're doing and what God's doing where we are. They, nobody, they, nobody, nobody's ever gone. We just talk about them. Jerry, here's what I found out. I preach about them from my pulpit. And I'm like, I, I've been thinking about this lately. Why am I wasting my time? Because they're not in here listening. They're not in here. They're not going to come in here. So we almost waste our time talking about all those people out there. Jesus didn't talk about those people out there. You know why? He talked to them out there. That's where he was. He's going throughout all the cities and the villages. He's teaching in their synagogues. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing every disease. Man, he is getting his hands dirty. We're afraid to get our walls dirty. I can remember one time we were using our, we, our church built a brand new gym. It's, it's about eight, eight or nine years old now. We've been there six years. And nobody ever used it. It was spick and spam when we got there. And I was like, man, we got to get this thing dirty. What, what happens? We start bringing people in and it starts getting dirty. Then we start fussing. I'm like, man, Jesus got his hands dirty. We're worried about walls getting dirty. That's what happens when we start reaching lost people and trying to reach out. That's where Jesus was. He's out there with the people. Notice verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus has a concern. He says, we've got to do something about this. And so in verse 38, he says, Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. God desires that the world knows him. He desires that the world comes to know him. And Jesus actually tells us to pray that. To pray that God would send out people into the world to share the gospel so the people can hear because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And that burdens the heart of God. It doesn't burden our heart. You know how you know? You'll pray about it. Now, I dread prayer being the church. Can I just be honest? That's the preacher's honesty. I hate prayer being in our church. Everything has been that way every church I've ever been to. Church has prayer meeting. You know what they're praying about? They're praying about Grandma in the hospital. Uncle Joe, who hurt his toe, he stopped his toe on a log, and so they're praying for him because he's not feeling good. Um, Sister so and so's back's hurting, and we need to pray for it. Listen, I'm not saying we don't need to pray for those things. I'm just telling you, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter uh, 9, verse 38, that we need to pray to God that He would send out laborers into His harvest. And we don't just need to pray for that, but we need to pray that earnestly. We need to pray that with a passion. When's the last time a prayer meeting, maybe you just had an hour long prayer meeting, just to pray that God would send people out to New York to, to see people saved? And you have that kind of prayer meeting. Start driving people away from the church because then it's not about us. It's about all those other people out there. And that's who God wants us to be concentrating on. It's so funny for us to be going to Long Island now because uh, I called some church planners in their church and been praying. God send somebody. We need workers up here in New York. And they identified a university uh, called Stony Brook University, which was about 20 minutes from them. They identified this, this, this university and they needed, they wanted somebody. They were praying that God was going to send somebody to Stony Brook University to come in and do some work on <coughs> Stony Brook University to try to reach these students with the gospel. Now, Stony Brook University is a major university in Long, in, in Long Island. 24,000 students. That's bigger than USC. It's bigger than Clemson. This is a major, major, major deal school. And so they start praying, God, send somebody. Well, guess what happens? Tasha and I have had a heart for college students for a while now. And uh, if we could have picked anywhere in the world we wanted to go, we would have gone somewhere to work with college students. And so we said, hey, you know, we, we want to, you know, wherever you guys think of that you just need somebody to serve, you know, we would love to serve there. But we would love to target college students. You know, God has just laid that burden on our hearts. They had just started praying the week before, God, send, get, send us somebody to target Stony Brook University. And so here they're praying, the church is praying, God, send somebody. We call them this week and say, we want to go to Stony Brook University. Man, send us. 
God answers those prayers. Amen. By the way, you can't pray for the world to be saved. You can't pray that God will send out souls or workers into the field without being one of those workers in the field. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, Jesus says, Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers into his harvest. Guess what happens in Matthew chapter 10? Read the next verse. Here's what Jesus does. He's talking to his disciples in Matthew 9, 38. Pray that God will send out laborers into his harvest. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus looks at them and says, Go. Go to the harvest. Hey, the same people, the people who are willing to pray to the Lord of the harvest and he would send out laborers into his harvest. Listen, when you start praying that prayer, he's going to use you to get out the harvest and start reaping the harvest for God's sake. That's what God does. God has a desire to see the world say, we, we all know this passage, right? Matthew chapter 28. Uh, Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse 18. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, we are going to, we're going to New York. I don't know if any of y'all know this or not, but there's a mayor up in New York. His name is de Blasio. Uh, some people say he is going to be a four, uh, just a four-year uh, mayor, uh, one-term mayor. Uh, this guy's a, he's a crazy, crazy, like liberal politicians look at this guy and go, you're a liberal. And that's pretty bad. When CNN calls you liberal, you're pretty bad, right? I mean, things aren't, aren't probably where they need to be. And so CNN calls this guy a liberal. And, uh, and so here's what he said. He said, listen, if you're a conservative, you are not welcome in my city. You're not welcome in New York City. Well, Mr. Mayor, and if I, I, I wish I could see him. Because I would love to tell you, I know somebody who has more authority than you do, and he has told me to come. Right? Jesus said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So look at verse 19. Go therefore. Listen, y'all, this is why we go. We go because Jesus has the authority. The mayor, the, the, the governor of New York says, hey, we don't want Christians here. You're not welcome in our, in our state. We don't want you here. There's no room for you. And Jesus has told us, I am the authority. And I have told you to go and to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's why you go. That's, that's why you go. Listen, everyone is all praying and ask God, God, where do you want me to go? The question is not, do you want me to go? Right? We want to pray, God, so God, do you want me to go? We know, because I, I just I can walk you through some more verses, by the way. Y'all need to do that? Um, I, I'll stick with just these four. Listen, we don't need to pray, God, do you want me to go? We need to pray the prayer, where do you want me to go? And by the way, it doesn't have to be New York. I'm going to give you some reasons why I ought to be New York, why we're going to New York, and why I think you all feel compelled to actually maybe go outside to maybe one of our cities and, uh, in, in, our, in our country. Um, but, but we know, we can see clearly why like God wants us to go. And by the way, this is clear all, all the way through throughout, throughout the Bible. When, when Josh and I ask this question, we hear the answer from New York. And I want to just kind of show you why New York City. Why, why New York? Okay? Why, why New York? Well, first of all, uh, New York City, the metropolitan area of New York City is the most important uh, city on the planet. Did you hear me? It is the capital city of the world. What happens in New York City is more important to the world than what happens in Washington, D.C. Now, our president might disagree because he's pretty pompous, but what happens in New York City, it, it affects the whole world. It is the capital city of the world. Forbes magazine said this in 2010. It called New York, the metropolitan area of New York, it called it the city with the largest global impact and most influence in the world. And that is true. New York City is the financial, the media, and the fashion capital of the world. And the world is coming to New York City. Before I put the next slide up there, New York, by the way, when I talk about New York City, I'm not just talking about the big buildings. I'm talking about the whole metropolitan area of New York City. It's a circle that's 75 miles in radius, okay? So if you put a dot in Times Square, New York City, and everybody, everybody knows what Times Square is. If, if, if you ever watch the ball drop on television, you know what Times Square is because that's where it is. Now, so this year, December 31st, 2014, when you're watching the ball drop, don't turn the television on too early because Molly might be on. So you've got to wait a little bit later. It's a little bit safer. It'll be closer to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to midnight again. But when you turn your television on and you watch Ryan Seacrest and he's watching that ball drop, that's in Times Square. Okay, so if you put a dot in Times Square and you draw a circle around that dot, 75 miles in radius, anybody want to guess how many people lives in that circle? If you look at my flyer, don't answer. Fifteen billion. How many? Fifteen billion. Billion. There are fifteen billion people on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said it was the most influential place. In the that, world. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's a good. That's the best guess I've heard yet, though. <laughs> Two billion. Not quite. Not quite. A few more than that. 
I'll tell you. Let me show you. 22.2 million. In that circle, in that 75 mile radius circle, y'all, there are 22.2 million people. All right? Let me just compare real quick. South Carolina. Anybody know how many people live in South Carolina right now? 4.3 million. 4.3 million in South Carolina. So this circle has five times more people than South Carolina does, okay? And they're all crammed in a little small spot. And, uh, and there are, by the way, there are more missionaries than us going up there to reach it. So that's, that's, what, that's what's exciting. So 22.2, by the way, this is a big old circle, right? I'm just doing this because I don't want to stay smart about the whole time. And uh, so 22.2 million people, and, 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 out, and, and, and we love this, we love this fact. If you just look up here, 200 countries are represented in that 22.2 million. Over 800 languages are spoken in this circle. Some people wonder, you know, the immigration, um, all, all that kind of rigmarole and all. Listen, I don't care where you stand on that immigration debate and all that kind of stuff. Although I do think we ought to think with the eyes of Jesus and not the eyes of America, okay? Um, so wherever, wherever you stand, people wonder why is the Lord coming here? You know why? Because Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 28 to go. You know what we didn't do? We didn't go. So God wants the world to be saved. So you know what he's doing? Instead of us going there, he says, hey, you've been lazy, you won't go there? I'll just bring them to you, prideful Americans, and I'll bring them to you because that's what I want, I want to see people say. So they're in New York. They're in the metropolitan area of New York City. Over 200 countries are represented, 800 languages spoken. But here's the number that burdens our heart. When we hear this number uh, of the 22.2 million, only 6% of these people know Jesus as their Savior. Isn't it a wicked place? Yeah, it's a wicked place. Is it a lost place? Yes, it's a lost place. Only 6% of the people know Jesus. All right, so here's the circle again. Here's the circle. 22.2 million. Only 6% know Christ. All right, if you do the math real quick, here's what it means. It means in this circle, y'all, listen to this number. In this circle, there are almost 21 million people who are on their way to hell forever because they have never heard of Jesus and they don't know Him and they're not trusting Him and they're not following Him. We cannot be silent. Somebody has to go. Somebody has to go and tell them. When you hear that number, 21 million people, there's a gigantic harvest of souls. By, by the way, 6% encompasses the metropolitan area of New York City. In Long Island, where we're going, the number is 2% of the Christ. There's one county, Nassau County in Long Island, a million and a half people in the county of Nassau County. There's only one English-speaking evangelical church to reach the million and a half people. In Suffolk County, the county that we're actually going to be living in, once again, a million and a half people in Suffolk County, uh, a million and a half people there. And, and one guy told me, he said, if you put all the believers together on a Sunday morning, you might have 300 people trying to reach 1.5 million people. Somebody has to go. There's a gigantic carcass of soul. People wonder, well, do we need missionaries? Do we need churches there? I'll show you this number. In South Carolina. In South Carolina, there is one Baptist church for every 2,229 residents. There's still work to do, right, Jeffrey? Do I have 2,229 residents? So there's still work to do. By, by the way, we were large church this morning. They didn't have 2,229 people. So there's still a word to do. We still need missionaries all throughout South Carolina. 80% of Black uh, Barnwell County, 80% of Barnwell County does not know Jesus as their Savior. 80% of residents in Blackville do not know Jesus as their Savior. 80% of them don't, don't have a relationship with Christ. So there's still a work to do here. However, there are churches. Y'all see them, right? He's riding down the road. There are churches that need to get on the ball trying to reach these people with the gospel. So there's one Baptist church for every 2,229 people. In New York metropolitan area, there is one Baptist church for every 76,337 people. There's a vast need of people like me and Tasha to move families to this area. Somebody has to go. When we hear these numbers, when we see the people, when we talk to the people, our hearts break. God's been doing this to me for, for a long, long time. We should, have done this ten, we should have done this 10 years ago. We just didn't have the faith to follow the Lord to do that. Honestly, that's just honest. Because God has always burdened our hearts with, with these numbers. We've seen the faces. We've heard the stories. This past year, we were, we were in Brooklyn, and there was a lady from Iran there. They'd been in America for six months. They're here on a tourist visa, so they have to turn in and go back home. In the six months they were here, they had come to know Jesus as their Savior. There were former Muslims who were born in Iran and now have come to know Jesus as their Savior. They're going back to Iran as missionaries for the Lord. How about what God is doing in New York, right? 
The world is there. Here's what Lottie Moon said when she went to China. You know, Lottie Moon was a little four foot nine inch little missionary. Midget. <laughs> Just a little short lady. She was fiery. She was a fiery, fiery woman. Here's what she said about China. She said, the needs of these people press upon my soul, and I cannot be silent. That's why this coming Friday, we're going to load that trailer up. We're going to go. Because God's going to do a work. Because God needs to do a work. Somebody has to go and share. So our plan is, our plan is to plant Transformation Church. Uh, um, this is, the, this is the, the, the desire, this is the, uh, the vision of our heart, is to go up and not only see people saved, not only see people pray to receive Christ as their Savior, but then when those people do, to organize them into a body of believers, a church, to say, listen, we are here to, to see people saved, so we're going we're gonna to try to uh, share Jesus with the lost. But then when we share Jesus with the lost and they pray to receive Christ, by the way, every one of you, this is where you fit in. You fit in here in every church. You ought to be reaching people with the gospel. But when you do, you are to be growing in your faith. And so we're calling people to not just, not just salvation. We're calling them to a life of transformation. And that's what God's been doing in my life. Man, for the last three or four years, God has grown me just immensely, personally. And uh, I'm not the man that I was five years ago. And I pray that five years from now, I won't be the man that I was tonight. In a, in a better way. In a better way. Um, I, I'm not the same person I was because God is transforming me. Now listen, if you know Jesus as your Savior, I'm here to tell you, when you trusted Him, you just started the journey. You are not done yet. And you won't be done until God calls you home. When He calls you home, He's going to immediately glorify you and make you glorified. But I'm here to tell you, until then, He wants to make you more like Jesus. And there is a work, and so we're calling people to that lifestyle. That's what the church has to do. The church has two primary purposes, and this is what we're going to try to carry out. Every church has two primary purposes. Number one, the church is to be reaching lost people. And number two, it's to be growing those people that it's reaching. It's a spiritual tour. That's what we're trying to do. Try to see people say, and then try to tour them spiritually. And that's where, that's where uh, churches like Healing Springs come in. You know, this church has already uh, blessed us financially. Did you know that? Um, you say, what can we do? Where, where do we come in? Uh, we, we, are, we are out. We've been doing this for six months now, uh, trying to find financial support. Um, we don't mind sharing that. Uh, if you have ever lived in the northeast, of the, if you've ever lived in any big city, by the way, you know this. You know it's more expensive to live there than it is in the rural areas. Um, in New York, just to kind of give you a comparison, we're not having to pay rent this year. <laughs> you know what? You go, God, God, God did that. Um, we're not having to pay rent this year. We're actually going to be staying in a parsonage that does not have a pastor, of a church that does not have a pastor. God worked that out completely. Um, and, we're, and there are no strings attached. Like, we don't have to go to that church and help them out. We, they just let them stay because, because they're kingdom minded. They're just partnering with us just like other churches have. So this church, y'all's church, has already partnered with us through so a Sunday school endeavor, but it costs a lot of money. It was going to cost us, um, and this is going to be year two for us, it's going to cost us $2,500 a month in rent. That's just rent. That's just a fact. And so, and here's what, here's what, here's what Satan is doing, right? Because God's trying to do a work. Y'all ever seen that movie, The Chronicles of Narnia? Um, I, love, I love the book, The Chronicles of Narnia. The movie's good, too. And uh, there's, a, there's a point in the movie where, where Mrs. Beaver comes in and tells the children, she says, Aslan is on the move. And Aslan is Jesus. Like, he's the illustration of Jesus. And, and I'm here to tell you, in New York, He's on the move. If you could meet some of the missionaries that I have met, they are the kind of missionaries that say, where's my water pistol? I am ready to charge the gates of hell. And that's the kind of people I want to be with, right? I want them to have my back. I want to have their back. I'll get the fox hold them any day. That's the kind of people who are going there. Because it's hard. It's difficult. And God is doing saying, Well, if it's so hard and so difficult, why go? That's exactly why you go. Because it is hard. We had one person come up to Tasha uh, one night. And he was trying to deter her. And he said this. He said, don't you know that place is evil and wicked? What in the world are you doing? She came home and told me that. I said, man, we got to go. If it's evil and wicked, somebody's got to go and tell those people. So that they can be changed. So we need help. We need financial help. We need churches like you and Springs. We need churches like James Branch. You're willing to say, hey, we're willing to put you on the budget. We believe in what God's doing so much. Now, 
Now, all you know, we're going through the North American Commission Board. We are uh, approved church planning missionaries from the North American Commission Board. But that doesn't mean a lot of money. It only means $1,000 a month from them. And so that didn't go a long ways in, in, in New York. Satan has put up barriers in our cities to say, it's too expensive to live here. You Christians need to stay out because you can't afford to live here. Listen, God's trying to do a work, and we've got to get over those barriers. And there's plenty of money out there that God has. We have just got to be faithful. And so we need, we need your finances. We're all not sharing that. I hate, I don't like having to come around, but for us to make it, that's what we have to do. We also, we want partners. We want churches to send their groups up to New York to serve with us. We actually, are, we've been asking people, uh, would you pray about moving to New York? It's maybe just for twenty five hundred dollars a month rent. That's that's we have four children, all right. So it's not that expensive for everybody. Although it's expensive for everybody, it's not that expensive. You can actually live in a little single uh, room place and a little flat, and you'll be all right. So it's only fifteen hundred dollars a month. So that's not that bad. And uh, but we, we we do we want your churches to come up. Bring the group up. We've got the group the church group, the church we wrap this morning. They're bringing the group of youth. They're actually bringing children and parents to come up. They got some children three years old coming up to serve with us this summer. Some of them have already said, I can't wait to see your daughters again so we can play with them. I thought, man, if they come for any reason than that, just to play with my kids, that would be a blessing upon blessing. And so we're asking people to come and say, well, won't you come up and serve with us in New York? And let us show you the area. Let us let you see us at work. And as, as we are ministering, you know what happens when you come into your church? Guess what happens in your neighborhood? You start doing the same things that you did up there. That's what I've always done. I'm like, I can't go to Atlanta and serve in Atlanta and do these kind of things. When I live on the Mill Hill and Kershaw, we've got to do some of those things as well. So it helps your church out too. And then finally, we want you to pray for us. And this, here's why we say this for last. Because a lot of times you go around and you start sharing about $2,500 a month. And you say, well, let me, let me give you some money. I, I feel good about giving you some money. Listen to me. Listen to me. And I mean this with all my heart. Some of you have known me for a long, long time. And you know I don't shoot words. If you don't pray for us, I don't want you to give us a God will meet our needs. We want people to be praying for us. And we are asking for that more than anything. You say, why? Well, what does prayer do? Prayer does everything. James chapter 4 verse 2 says, you don't have because you don't ask. We are going to see lost people say that's what we're going up there for. We're seeing them grow. And so we're just going to ask God for that. We have some flyers. We're back table. We don't have enough coming to see me. I've got some more. Um, on our flyer, there is a daily prayer guide. And it just tells you how you can pray for me and Tasha and the family. Um, just particular prayers that you can just be praying for us to keep us in your mind. And so we are asking you churches to please pray for us. We are asking for carpet bombs of prayer over Long Island to just say, God, get the work done. How's a southern guy who loves the Gamecocks go up to New York and reach Long Islanders? When I see them <coughs> and bam, and I hold the doors open for ladies, how in the world does a guy like that go up to New York and reach people? You know how? I don't. How's that happen? God does it. Same way He does here. So we're asking you to pray for us. Thank you for your attentiveness. I'm not even going to look at my watch because I don't even know what time it is. I don't know how far I'm going to go every time. So uh, actually, Jeffrey didn't tell me any time. Because so, you don't know when this is, right? So there's really no expectation, right? Yes, you don't even know. I could go until 8. Now I'm going to get home. We've got to start packing. So uh, we've actually got, we've got that trailer underneath our car park right now. We've got to start packing. What questions about my dad? See, the good thing about being long-winded is when you go long-winded, if somebody asks a question, everybody starts looking at them like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> don't you know this? Somebody said in the seminary, the professor would go over and say, what? We do, we do. We, we have brochures. They're on that back table. But I also, I'll try to put some out too as soon as we do. They're there. They tell you all kind of good stuff. We have a website. Probably the best way to keep in touch with us, though, honestly, is our Facebook page. Um, we have a Facebook page. It's a special page, Transformation Church NYC. And uh, that's the best way we can use that as a blog and put videos and that kind of thing just to keep people up like a newsletter so that people can keep in touch with us. Any questions? Any more questions? Jenny, I would like to say one thing. Um, the Lord told me to
and the young girl, um, was calling, I was trying to talk to the secretary of the First Baptist Church, but somebody else, a friend of mine, she got up and she said that she heard Tasha speak. And she said, I have already started praying for that thing. She said, what she said is really good. Y'all missed the best speaker, by the way. And I remember telling um, your mother-in-law, I mean, Rhonda, I said, well, what about finances? Can we help them? But you just told me what you need more than anything yeah. is for it. And, you know, we'll try to do that for you as much as we can. Everybody can pray. Yes. Every, and everybody should pray. If you're a believer, you should be doing it. Not for us, too, by the way. There are more. I mean, Chicago's got people like us. San Francisco's got people like us. Um, the North American Mission Board has identified, if you, have, if you know anything about the North American Mission Board, you know they have something called the SIN Initiative. You see, the SIN, um, it's, it's all, it's, we're going as part of the SIN New York uh, Initiative. They've got 32, they've identified 32 metropolitan areas in our country that said, listen, we have got to get missionaries to these areas. And people say, why the cities? You know, and, and almost like we, you know, we get prideful again. We say, what about our towns? You know, don't our towns need missionaries? We, everybody needs missionaries. And that's what you were for. That's what the church is for, to be reaching our towns. But, but listen, when you reach the cities, when you reach the cities, culture changes. Now, every one of us would agree with the statement, right? Our nation is in dire need of spiritual revival awakening. If that's going to happen, Listen, if it's going to happen, it has to start in our cities. In cities in particular like New York, like Chicago, like Philadelphia, like Los Angeles, like San Francisco. You say, why? Because what happens in the cities flows down and away from those cities to the towns and the other areas of the country. That's what happens. Our, our president, our president was elected by the cities. I don't know if you've seen a map of the election, of the election results. Towns did not elect President Obama. The cities did. And I'm not saying President Obama's evil. Or I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying it was the cities that determined that. And so if you're going to, you know, if, if, you were to, if we all used uh, the Edisto River, and, and this is a big deal, right? I mean, around here, that's been the fight, right? The Edisto River. They've been draining water out of the Edisto River for that, that kind of farm. <laughs> Well, what was, the, what was the fear? Well, if you, if you hurt the headwaters, then it messes up everything else downstream. Listen, our cities are the headwaters of culture in our, in, in our country, around the world. 81%, 81% of Americans live in cities now. 81%. And there are going to be more. That number is actually increasing right now. People say, well, isn't everybody moving from New York down south? No. New York is the fastest growing city in America right now. It was last year, will be this year. And that's, it's not even close, by the way. So people aren't moving away, they're actually moving there. We've got to get there. They're moving there faster than the church is. And so we've got to reach the cities, and we're just part of that. Pray for other cities. Start praying for our cities that God would send missionaries there. Uh, because, because they all are, are basically in the same, same life, spiritually. If you've been there, you know that, right? You might go to New York. Who's been to New York? Other than an eighth grade field trip, right? Uh, I know our eighth grade goes to goes to New York every year on a field trip. Uh, how many of you have actually ridden the subway in New York? Who's ridden the subway? Uh, yeah. You get to see real New York on the subway. You don't get to see it. When you go to Times Square and Section, you don't see New York. You see all the, all the uh, visitors in New York. You've got to get on the subway and, and then go out to some of the different boroughs. And that's where you can really see New York. And sometimes you see more than you care to see. And you hear more than you care to hear. You really, you really have to be here. Any more questions? All right, thank y'all. Jeffrey, thank you for allowing us to share. And, uh, and, and Tasha's here. We're, we're not going anywhere. Um, we're just going home. That's all we're doing. And uh, going, going to hopefully get some rest maybe tonight. We don't have any children tonight. So uh, they're staying with Lolly and Pops tonight. So uh, we're hoping to maybe get some rest uh, this afternoon and evening. Well, hopefully we won't have to be going, y'all be quiet back there. Actually, our kids will be asleep five minutes down the road. So, Jeffrey, thank you, man. Y'all pray for us this week. We still have a lot of good advice to share, a lot of good advice to say. We're going to be in our home church uh, Wednesday night for the last time. And, uh, and, and that'll, be, that'll be an emotional night. And then just leaving and uh, leaving, leaving some of our friends and that kind of thing. So, really, really be praying for us this week. And uh, we will just be satisfied with God. Appreciate it.